Love you, brother. Love you, too. Good morning, church. As we gather this morning, um, what a beautiful song to remind us uh, why we're here. Uh, psalm, the 23rd Psalm is often a psalm that we hear at funerals, but it's really a psalm that's a psalm for life. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. That's about as far as I can get. Um, but I hear some of y'all still got it memorized. It's a beautiful thing to memorize Scripture, to come back to and remember uh, who God is in the, the highs of life, but in the lows of life. And Psalm 23 is a psalm that, that says, He brings us into green pastures. Um, Though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. The, the passage we're in this morning is, is one of wilderness. Uh, and he, he, he makes reference to there's plenty of green pasture. There's plenty of green space for the people to sit on. And, and there's, you know, John, I, I've been saying this for weeks now, John writes on so many different levels, beautifully constructing the gospel message. You can read these stories on face value and just go, man, how great is Jesus? And that's awesome. You can read it, you know, right there on the surface and be moved by the things that Jesus does. But the, the more you get familiar with the biblical narrative from Genesis to Revelation, the more layers you see in the Gospel of John. You hear echoes of the Lord is my shepherd, or Jesus will come along later. And we'll do a series on the I am statements of Jesus. But Jesus along later will say, I am the good shepherd. And you hear hints of that in this passage where he, he calls the people to sit in the green spaces and he feeds them with bread in abundance. You see uh, a picture in this passage of Jesus going up on the mountainside. And up on the mountainside, uh, we, we see Jesus as a type of Moses. Because uh, up on the mountainside is where Moses goes and his disciples sit with him. And he's looking out over the people. And they're looking for a leader. And he takes care of them uh, as Moses did the people of Israel. But when we think about wilderness, we, we remember that, or we, we kind of connect with that a little bit right now. Um, do you ever feel like you're just a little bit lost? Or maybe just things just don't seem like they should be, and just the, the world is kind of lost. The way the world was when I was growing up is different then than it is today. And the world many of you grew up in was different then than it is today. And even in, you know, the four years between being in youth group and becoming a youth minister, life for teenagers changed drastically in four years. And I started realizing the world is going to be changing quicker and quicker. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm the last generation to remember time before cell phones. Uh, the time before social media, I was the generation transitioning into all those things. And so I've seen the world change. And it bothers me how much it's changed. And it feels like we're in the wilderness. And at the beginning of the year, I, I, I preached a series on navigating or on canoeing the mountains and how uh, Lewis and Clark, as they were traveling west, exploring the Louisiana Purchase, they were looking for a passage where they would canoe. The idea was they would canoe up the Missouri. They would carry their canoes over the mountains, mountains kind of like the Appalachians, and then they would hop in the Columbia, the Columbia River and head on to the Pacific Ocean. It'd be simple. All of the skills they had that brought them up to this point would then carry them to their destination. But when they got to Limhi Pass, what did they find? 
a small set of mountains called the Rockies. And all of their plans changed except for the mission because the mission they had to find a passage to the Pacific, that mission never changed, but everything that brought them up to that point wasn't going to carry them through the Rockies. And so while the train was changing, they found themselves more and more in the wilderness. As a church, we, we need to become more comfortable with life in the wilderness. Because when we look at the biblical narrative, what we find is a, a people that, that God chose for a purpose. Uh, and this is one of the things we have to remember about God. God belongs to no people. There's no group of people that can lay claim on God as their own. But God did choose a people to be a light to the nations, to remind all people that He is their God. And so no nation can, can lay claim that, that Yahweh God is our God and our God alone. And most of the stories of the Old Testament is God reminding His people that He loves the Ninevites, too, in the story of Jonah. Uh, he does actually love the Babylonians. Live such good lives while you're in exile that the Babylonians will give glory to God. That the prophets are reminding, constantly reminding their God's people that God loves the world because he created the world as his own. And it was in the wilderness, when, when God called Israel out of Egypt, it was in the wilderness that they were to learn relationship with God. And you remember the story? They don't do very well with this. The whole time they're in the wilderness, they're saying, Moses, it was better to be slaves than to go through what we're going through right now. And so quickly we turn away from what we're supposed to learn in the wilderness. And, and the warning that Moses gives in Deuteronomy chapter 6 to the people as they're about to go into the promised land is, he gives the Shema, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God. You know, he, go, he goes on to talk about God is the God. Do not forget God. And at the end of Deuteronomy chapter 6, he says, when you go and you live in the land and you live in houses you didn't build, you, you eat from crops you didn't plant, do not forget God. And it's this message that Israel keeps going back to. It's a message of remembrance. Do not forget God. And the temptation when you get comfortable in the land and you make the place your home and all life seems to go well, it's easy to forget God because I don't need God anymore. I've got my own crops. I don't need God anymore. I have my own house. I don't need the protection of God anymore. I can protect myself. And you see Israel start crying out, we need a king like the other nations. And that's a rejection of God. And I'm summing up the Old Testament story to make this point. At the center of Jewish life, at the center of the Jewish year, is a festival called the Passover. And this is the foundational story that they gather around the table together, the Passover feast, to break bread, to drink wine, and to remember what God did when he called them out of Egypt. And when they gather around the Passover feast together, when they gather around the table, they look back to what God has done to remember now what God is doing and to look forward to what God will do for his people. That when they, when they gather around the Passover, the whole point of the Passover is to remember God's promise. And even in times where, where they got too comfortable in the land and they were sent into exile, they're sent back to the wilderness they continued the practice of the Passover to tie them back to the stories of who they are as God's people. 
We are the people that God steps in and liberates us from slavery to take us home to the promised land. And even when Israel was back in the promised land, they were under captivity of the Romans. And this is the scene of, of John chapter 6. And in John chapter 6, he, he lays out this, this beautiful picture. He says, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. In verse 4, it says, Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. And, you know, John is such a beautiful writer that he, he's not putting anything in there by accident. He is intentionally giving you information because what he wants you to do is to see everything that happens in this next section of his gospel account is, is supposed to be seen in view of the Passover. And if you look at the gospel of John as a whole, he actually lays this out beautifully that the beginning of Jesus's ministry in chapter 2, verse 13 He's in the temple. He clears the temple. And I've, I've said this a few times that John puts, puts the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of Jesus' ministry so that we then look at everything Jesus does through the phrase, I am the temple. Destroy this body and I'll raise it in three days. I am the presence of God with you. But in, in chapter 2, verse 13, it, it says it was the Passover. And again, we, we read this and we just miss that information, but, but, but John beautifully writes this. He says, the Passover and the temple, and he brings those together. That the Passover is the presence of God with Israel, liberating them from slavery. And the temple is the presence of God, making them the people of God. And he, he places this at the beginning, and then you come to this story in chapter 6 where it says, now it was the Passover. And he's going to talk about bread from heaven. And you see the connections that when Jesus later uh, in, a, in a passage that we'll get to when we, when we do the I am statements, he says, I am the bread of life. We've been meditating on that passage this week. That, that Jesus is connecting himself with the table and saying this, the, the bread that we take in the Passover, the bread that God provided in the wilderness, the manna, I am the bread of life and I bring the bread in abundance. When you take of it, you eat the nourishment you need. And then at the end of Jesus' ministry, when he's going to the cross in chapter 11, John emphasizes three times that this is the Passover. In chapter 11, verse 55, chapter 12, verse 1, and chapter 13, verse 1, it's all in that week leading up to the cross. John three times says, it was the Passover. It was the Passover. It was the Passover. Because the whole point of the Gospel of John is all of these signs and all these festivals are pointing to the end where Jesus gets on the cross as the Paschal Lamb, as the Passover Lamb, made as a sacrifice. But it doesn't end there. He brings liberation. As the new Moses he brings liberation from sin, not just liberating you, not just liberating me, not just liberating individuals, but bringing all of creation into liberation from the slavery of sin. All of this is looking forward to the resurrection where all things will be made new again. And so John reminds us, now it was the Passover when this happens. Verse 5, it says, lifting up his eyes then he, and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus says to Philip, and you know, it's, it's got to be hard to be a disciple. We, we laugh at the disciples at the silly things they do and say, but they were there. They were trying. 
And I hope these passages allow you to laugh at yourself a little bit to then be a better disciple of Jesus. Because he looks at, he looks at Philip and says, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And he said this to test Philip. Because he already knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, I mean, Philip, I mean, this is not, I can't get my mind around this, but Philip looks out at the crowd and goes, okay, if you, you know, carry the one. Okay, it's going to cost about 200 denarii worth of bread. And that wouldn't even be enough for each of them to have a little. And, and what, what's going on with Philip right now is he's, he's like Nicodemus. Remember when we talked about Nicodemus where, where Jesus says you got to be born again and he's talking about birth from above and he's talking about a spiritual rebirth and all Nicodemus can handle is this physical understanding that i got to get back in the womb. And it's easy to be hard on Philip, but think about it. Philip was there when Mary said, hey, they're out of wine. And Jesus turned water into an abundance of wine for the great wedding. Philip was there. He knows what Jesus can do. Philip was there when the official comes and says, my, my son is dying, and Jesus just speaks and says, your son's living. Philip was there, and he saw what, what happened with the official's son. And he was there when they're walking along and they see the pool of Bethesda and they, and they see the lame man and Jesus just doesn't even ask him if he has faith, doesn't even ask him um, if he believes. He just says, get up and walk, carry your mat. Philip was there. He sees what Jesus can do. And when Jesus says, how are we going to feed all these people? And as the reader of John, you should be laughing at Philip a little bit and saying, come on, Philip, you've seen what Jesus can do. But then we turn the mirror around and we look at it and we say, okay, where, where have I failed to recognize Jesus continually shows up in life? And when you hear the stories of other people, you say, I see where Jesus has shown up. We then look at the problems of the world and we say, what are we going to do? And all the world's changing and all the world is uncertain right now and we're back in the wilderness and we're, and we're like Philip, we're going, there's nothing we can do about this. And I look at all the problems of the world right now and I wish there was an easy fix, but this story reminds us that it's not about what I can come up with. But it's about what Jesus can do with a very little. And what we come to is one of the disciples, verse 8, it says, one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? And Andrew at least has a, a glimpse of who Jesus is and says, this isn't much, but it's something. And then you think about the boy, the boy sitting there going, I got some bread. And it's, we look at the simplicity of children sometimes and we, and we laugh because we see things on a physical spectrum and they maybe see things on a more spiritual spectrum where the child is saying, Okay, there's 5,000 men. Who knows how many women and children also? But I've got, I've got five loaves of bread and a few fish. And, and the message here is, what's the little bit that you have that in the hands of Jesus can turn into an abundance? That when you stand here with the little boy, you say, what is it that you can offer that Jesus can turn into an abundance, that when we all bring the little bit we have, Jesus then transforms it into a community of abundance, that when all of us start bringing and putting things on the table, Jesus then says, oh, I can use this, and that he blesses the multitudes. What is it that you have? 
verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. And the word here in Greek, it translates weird in English. We just hear it as sit down, but, but the word is actually recline. And the word that's being used here is actually uh, have them sit down as though they're going to have a meal. Uh, and they would recline at these tables. And so all these people are out in the fields uh, on, the, on the mountainside, and they're reclining as though preparing for a meal. Jesus says, prepare them for a meal. Now there was much grass in that place, and we hear echoes of Psalm 23. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And they had eaten their fill. He told the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the, from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When you put the story into the Passover context, you start hearing echoes of the Lord's Supper. I, I've, made, I've made comments along the way in the Gospel of John that he leaves out significant stories that the other Gospels make sure and highlight. And one of the significant stories that John leaves out is the institution of the Lord's Supper. But many scholars believe as they study the Gospel of John that the entire Gospel is actually a Eucharistic passage, a Lord's Supper passage. Because what you have at the beginning of Jesus' ministry is Jesus providing wine in abundance. And it's this memory uh, that you look forward to the wedding banquet that is to come in the, the, the table of the Lord's Supper. It looks back to the Passover. It looks back to the meal that we remember what God has done in the wilderness. But it's also a table that looks forward to what is to come in the wedding banquet. And so when we hear that Jesus turns water to wine for the wedding feast, he's providing wine, the best wine in abundance for the wedding feast that is to come. And then we come to this passage, and it talks about the Passover. The Passover is here, and Jesus provides bread and how much bread does he provide? In abundance. That when you think about this, the stories in Exodus where, where, G, where God is providing manna in the wilderness, how did, do you remember how that story goes? Every morning they're to get up. They are to go to the fields and collect the manna. And they're only supposed to get enough manna for the day because at the end of the day it'll go bad. And the whole point of that experience in the wilderness is dependence on God because every day you wake up and you have to depend on God to provide for you. That if you were to store up lots of manna, what's going to happen to it the next day? It's going to be bad. And it's going to the wilderness is a reminder that God is the one who provides for us. The wilderness has been uh, a place where Christians for two millennia have, have gone to, to remember what it means to be in relationship with God. That at the time of Constantine, when, when before Constantine in, in the fourth century, when Christianity became the, the state religion of Rome, the national religion, before Constantine, it took great courage to be a Christian. After Constantine, with the institutionalization of, of Christianity in Rome, after Constantine, it took great courage to be a pagan. And so one of the things the Christians did in, in that time is they didn't want to lose the ancient faith with all these people now coming into Christianity, all these people saying, if I want to have a place in society, I need to be in the church because now it is the state-sponsored religion. 
they fled to the wilderness to preserve the ancient faith because the, a walk with God, a walk with Jesus is one of walking in the wilderness in dependence on God. And so they went to the wilderness so that they'd have to keep depending on God. They separated themselves from society. This is the foundation of monasticism. This is the foundation of monasteries. Uh, there's a whole debate about monasteries, but the point is Christians often retreat to the wilderness to find relationship with God to sustain them when they go back to the cities. This is how Jesus started his ministry. He goes to the wilderness to find dependency on God and to learn what does it mean to be son of God. And out of that, he does his ministry. This is the season of Lent. Lent is a time of retreating to the wilderness, withholding something from life to make a sacrifice to prepare yourself for the coming resurrection that is Easter. We go to the wilderness to remind us that we are supposed to depend on God for everything. And when we go to the wilderness, we are reminded that Jesus is the one who brings us bread in abundance. And it's not just bread in abundance, but it is his body himself. That when we break bread, we, we take Jesus with us. And that bread never runs out. And the wine, the good wine in abundance, never runs dry. And the promise to the woman at the well that we haven't read that story yet, the promise is the water of life that flows from Jesus never runs dry. And so if you're feeling lost right now, if you're looking at the country and the world and it's all just feels foreign and it feels like wilderness. This is a familiar place for Christians. That when the world feels like it's run amok, this is a time for us to remember to follow Jesus, the one who provides in abundance. There's 12 baskets left over. Uh, the number 12 is a number of completeness. And so how much abundance is left over every time you gather at the table? Complete abundance. And, and this whole passage, there's so many places that we can go to in it. But this whole passage is about the Lord's Supper. That when we gather around the table, we find ourselves in different places. And you can look at the different characters um, who gather around the table in this passage. And you find yourself in different places with this. And, and the passage that's been, the part that's been sticking with me this week is uh, in my studies of the Lord's Supper, one of the things that has just been transformative for me in the last few years as I've studied the Lord's Supper uh, and how Christians have approached the table for the last 2,000 years is God could have chosen anything to represent the body and blood of Christ. He could have chosen wheat and he could have chosen grapes. Those are things he provides us. We could, have, we could have taken wheat and just chewed on it. We could have taken grapes and just eaten it because those are the things that God provides. But the beautiful thing about the table is God doesn't provide the elements. He provides the things for the elements. And this is what I mean. How do you get bread? You take the grain and you you get to take part in what happens at the table because you have to take grain and you have to make it into bread. And one of the practices in, in the liturgical churches, and this all makes me uncomfortable, but I think it's beautiful in what's going on is they then lift the bread up and they say, God, this is our gift to you. This is what we bring to the table. 
you transform this into nourishment for the people. And so what, what's actually going on here is, is they're saying, God, this is, this is just five loaves of bread for a multitude, but you've invited me to bring something to the table. Can you imagine the God who spoke creation into existence allows you to bring your gifts to the table? He allows you to bring something to the table that then turns into the nourishment of all people. And he doesn't just say, uh, okay, now take the wine. He says, press the grapes, let it ferment, turn it into wine. You get to be part of the process of bringing nourishment to the people. And, and we lose sight of this when we just go and buy it at the store. I, I've, I've tried to think about what would it look like, and this is pre-quarantine, uh, but what would it look like for us if, if someone uh, every week baked bread for the church as a gift to the body? And they prayed over the bread, and they prayed for families by name every week that, that this bread would have nourishment. How would that transform our church that when we break bread together, I know that, you know, Donald, if, if you and Tawana and Cheney were, were making the bread, that you prayed for me that this would nourish me in my walk with Christ. How would that transform the body? I've even thought about, you know, in our tradition, there's, there's a magical phrase we use, separate and apart. That in a lot of times in traditions, we, we, uh, we break the bread and we say, out of convenience, we also pass the trays for contribution. This is separate and apart from the Lord's Supper. What if we actually brought those together and we said, the, the gifts that you bring monetarily are for the nourishment of the people, that when we bring our money together, we're giving a small gift to God that God will then multiply in abundance for all people. That when we actually tied those things together with communion, we're actually getting a more full picture of what we're doing when we break bread together. And so the, the passage, the part of this passage I've been reflecting on the most this week is, what does it mean to be the young child, the small boy, and to look at the little bit that I have and say, I'm just going to put this on the table and I'm going to relinquish it into Jesus' hands and say, you've got this. You're going to do incredible things. What, what are the small things that you have, the small gifts, the, the small abilities, and you say, this seems in, insignificant. And so often when something seems in, insignificant, we hold on to it. But if we say, I have this small ability, help me give this to Jesus. We want to be a family. We want to be a church that looks at the small gift that you have, and we say, how can we turn that into abundance in the hands of Jesus? And so let's, let's travel from the head to the heart. And I, wanna, I want you to think about the different characters. Maybe this morning you need to reflect on the young boy. What is the small gift you have that you need to put in the hands of Jesus? Or maybe you're Andrew. Maybe you're a person that looks around and says, Anthony, Vanily, I you've got great things. I recognize the good things that you have for the kingdom. Let me, let, me, let me bring you to Jesus and show you the things that you can do to let him multiply that. How can we new, use your new business to give glory to God? Let's pray together about that. Stephen, you've got gifts. How do we use your gifts for the glory of God? Can you pray? Let's pray for people. You, you do beautiful at leading singing. Let's lead singing. How can we glorify God with that? Stephen, you're one of the most encouraging people I know, and that is used for the glory of God. And so how do you, be, how do you need to be Andrew right now and recognize the gifts in other people and bring them to the table and say, let's give this to the hands of Jesus to be multiplied? Or maybe you're Philip this morning, and you've, you've been with Jesus for a long time, but you've been missing it. 
you've been missing what Jesus is doing. So whenever the troubles of life come up, you're sitting there going, I don't, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do about this. And Jesus just going, I already know. Just open your eyes, Philip. Maybe what we need to be doing to help each other when we're sitting with Philip is to share the stories of what Jesus has done in our lives. Because when I hear your stories of how Jesus has been transforming you, it helps me to lean more on Jesus for transformation. That when I hear your stories of where you used to be and where you are now and how Jesus is working with you, it opens my eyes more. And so maybe we need to be sharing our stories together more. Or maybe you're the crowd this morning. You're following Jesus around because he's done some pretty cool stuff, but you kind of stay at a distance. Uh, the other part of this passage I've been wrestling with this week is this last part. Verse 15 says, Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. I've been wrestling with that part of the passage, wondering where are the times in my life where I try to make Jesus the king I want him to be rather than let him be the king that he is. That sometimes what I want to do is I want Jesus to be a king that I take benefits from. And I follow him because of the cool things he's been doing. And I, I just follow him because of the benefit I get out of it rather than the benefit I then give to others. And so often we, we try to make Jesus king of me and my people, me and my party, me and my race, me and my fill in the blank. We try to make Jesus the king over us rather than the king over the world. And when I read that passage, like Jesus wants to be king, but he doesn't want to be king over these people. He wants to be king over all people. And so where in my life am I trying to force Jesus to be the king I want him to be? And so where are you this morning? As we gather around the table, are you sitting in the grass recognizing the abundance, but fail to draw near, and you're just taking the blessings of Jesus? Or are you standing next to Jesus but forgetting who he is and what he can do? Or are you standing there with just a couple of gifts and saying, I don't know what you can do with this, but you're Jesus. As we come around the table, spend some time in reflection on how Jesus is calling you to approach this space. Let's prepare to break bread together, the bread of life, the bread that is given to us in abundance. Donald, come and lead us.